Hi, I'm Geraldo. Today I'm going to talk about our work Tamuv, a new methodology and benchmark suite for evaluating the Tamuv member index. First, I'm going to give an overview of what this talk is about. It is known that data movement is a major bottleneck in modern systems. However, it's still unclear how we can identify different sources of data movement bottlenecks and also the most suitable data movement mitigation technique, as for example, compute-centric data movement te mitigation techniques as caching and prefetching, or memory-centric data movement mitigation techniques as in data processing for a given data movement bottleneck. Therefore, the goal of this work is twofold. First, we want to design a methodology that can identify different sources that lead to data movement bottleneck in application. And second, we want to compare computer memory centric data movement mitigation techniques for such data movement bottlenecks. To do so, we perform a large scale application and characterization to identify the key metrics that can reveal the sources of data movement bottleneck in different applications. Based on that, we draw four key contributions. The first contribution is our experimental characterization on 77,000 functions across 145 applications from varied domains. Second, we develop and validate the methodology that can characterize applications based on their sources of data movement bottleneck into six different classes of data movement bottlenecks using four key metrics, and also their relationship with the different data movement mitigation techniques, including the data processing. Third, using our methodology, we develop TAMOV, a new benchmark suite with 144 functions for data movement related studies. And fourth, we showcase how the move can be used to study open research problems related to data movement with four case studies. The move is open source and available in our GitHub repository. Here's the outline for this talk. First, I'm going to talk about data movement bottlenecks and their protection solutions. Then, I'm going to explain our workload characterization methodology, which consists of three steps application profiling, locality based clustering, and memory bottleneck analysis. Finally, I'm going to talk about our case studies. So let's get started with data movement bottlenecks. Data movement is a major source of inefficiency in today's systems. It does become a problem because of at least three different reasons. Because the application does not have enough data locality and thus it does not take effective use of the cache hierarchy. Second, because the memory device cannot provide enough bandwidth for application. And third, because the application or system cannot tolerate the high average memory access time associated to access DRAM. Modern systems have evolved to include mechanisms that can alleviate the impact of data movement bottleneck in application performance or energy consumption. Those techniques range for, for example, deep cache hierarchies and hardware prefetchers. We call these techniques compute centric. However, such techniques often fail to mitigate data movement bottlenecks for many modern applications. Therefore, a solution are the so-called memory-centric architectures. A memory-centric architecture mitigates data movement bottleneck by moving computation nearby to the DRAM chip itself. The data processing, or NDP, is a good example of a memory-centric architecture. The logic in an NDP architecture has access to DRAM with higher DRAM bandwidth and also shorter DRAM average memory access time. Therefore, the goal of the data processing is to mitigate data movement bottlenecks in modern systems. The data processing is not a new idea. In fact, the first data processing architectures have been proposed five decades ago. However, only recently, the industry has started to introduce the data processing architectures. I'm going to highlight two of them here. First, the upmem architecture, introduced by a company of same name, which integrates near to DRAM banks compute capabilities targeted to accelerate general purpose computing. This architecture provides a peak throughput of 0.9 TRL operations per second. Second, the Samsung Fin DRAM architecture, which also integrates nearby DRAM banks some compute capabilities targets to accelerate neural networks. This architecture can provide a peak throughput of 1.2 teraflops per second. Many other works also employ near data processing architecture for other application domains, for example, as graph processing, mobile consumption workloads, neural networks, DNA sequence mapping, databases, time series, and many more. All of those works use different techniques to identify if applications suffer from data movement bottlenecks and often use such approaches to say if application would benefit from NDP of loading or not. However, as I'm going to show next, those approaches are not comprehensive enough in identifying different sources that can lead to data movement bottlenecks and also identifying when an application is suitable for NDP of loading. I highlight two different models that are commonly used to identify when applications suffer from data movement bottlenecks. The first one is the so-called rough line model, which correlates the arithmetic intensity of application with the performance of the application. 
The second one is using high less level cache misses per kilo instructions as an indication of the NDP suitability. So first let's look at the roofline model. The roofline model is a simple model to identify when an application is compute bound or memory bound. It defines in the X axis the arithmetic intensity of the application in operations per byte, and the Y axis the performance of the application in gig operations per second. It has two main lines. The first line is called a compute roof and defines this peak system throughput. Applications below this curve are called to be compute bound, and prior works have shown that compute bound applications are not suitable for NDP offloading. The second line is the memory roof, defined as the bandwidth of the DRAM device times the arithmetic intensity of the application. Applications below this line are called to be memory bound, and they are not suitable for NDP offloading. We take this model with more than 40 applications in order to identify when they benefit from NDP offloading or not. We classify the applications into four different categories. The first one are the applications that run fast on the CPU compared to running an NDP system. The second one are applications that run fast on the NDP system compared to running on the CPU. The third one are applications that have similar performance when running the CPU and NDP system. And the fourth one are applications that performance depend on different system configurations. We make the following observations. First, memory bound applications are faster on NDP system as expected. Second, we observe that some compute bound applications run faster on the CPU compared to running on NDP system, also as expected. However, we see that there are some memory bound applications that are faster on the CPU or performance depends. And we see similar observations for some compute bound applications. Therefore, we conclude that the roofline model does not accurately account for the NDP suitability of memory bound applications. A second approach commonly used is to identify an application that has high less level cache misses per kilo instructions, which usually is a value larger than 10. Those applications are said to be memory intensive and can benefit from NDP offload. We validate such observations by observing the NDP speed up over the CPU for different applications and correlate with their less level cache in PKI. We make the following observations. First, applications with high in PKI are faster NDP system as expected. Second, applications with low MPKI are faster on the CPU, also as expected. However, we see that there are some applications with low MPKI that can be faster on NDP, have similar performance on the CPU or NDP, or performance can depend on different system configurations. Therefore, we conclude that less level cache MPKI alone does not currently account for the NDP suitability of memory bound applications. Therefore, we conclude there is no available methodology that can comprehensively classify applications based on their data movement bottlenecks, and second, correlate those data movement bottlenecks with the most suitable data movement mitigation technique. Thus, our goal with this work is to develop a methodology that can identify the different sources of data movement bottleneck in an application, and second, to comprehensively compare compute and memory-centric data movement mitigation techniques. Now, I'm going to give a brief overview of our workload characterization methodology. We develop a new workload characterization methodology that can identify different data movement bottlenecks in the application and also the suitability of different data movement mitigation techniques for such data movement bottlenecks. To do so, we use two different profile tools. The first one are architecture independent profiling tools, which can characterize the name behavior of the application independently of the underlying hardware setup. The second one are architecture dependent profiling tools, which can evaluate the impact of the system configuration on the memory behavior. Our methodology has three main steps. It takes as input the target application source code and it inputs data set. In the first step, we profile the application in order to identify function that suffer from memory bottlenecks using a hardware profiling tool. Then we use our new simulator called the MooSim in order to evaluate the performance benefits of different data movement mitigation techniques and collect key metrics for the function identifying step one. In step two, which is called locality-based clustering, we use architecture-independent profiling tools to classify the memory access behavior or a particular application. Then in step three, we collect architecture-dependent metrics and perform a scalability analysis of the application selected in step one. Based on that, we can classify the applications into six different classes of data movement bottlenecks and also correlate each class of data movement bottleneck with the most suitable data movement mitigation technique. So we start by looking at step one of our methodology. The goal of the first step is to identify application functions that suffer from data movement bottlenecks. To do so, we use a hardware profiling tool. In this work, we use the Intel VTune profiling tool, which provides a metric called memory bound, which defines the percentage of CPU pipeline slots that are empty due to load store operations. Next, we look at step two. The goal of the second step is to analyze applications' memory characteristics independently of the underlying hardware device. To do so, we analyze two key metrics. First, special locality. 
To compute special correlates, we collect the memory trace of the application and build a histogram called Stripe Profile Histogram, where each bin represents how many times the profile have appeared in the memory trace. For example, we have that over here, the stride between the first access address and the second access address is equals to one. And then we increment bin one in order to indicate the such stride has been observed. We use the cumulative distribution of the stride profile histogram in order to calculate the final special locality value. Application with random access pattern has low spatial locality, while application with more sequential access patterns has high spatial locality. Similarly, we also compute the temporal locality of application. We also use a memory trace in order to create a histogram called reuse profile histogram, where each bin restores how many times a name address is repeated throughout the execution of the application. In this example over here, memory address A is repeated four times. Based on that, we increment the reuse profile histogram in bin 4 in order to indicate that such reuse has been identified. We also calculate the cumulative distribution of the reuse profile histogram in order to calculate the final temporal locality value. Applications with low temporal locality suffer from low data reuse, while application with high temporal locality has high data reuse. Finally, let's look at step 3. While step two allows us to understand the memory characteristics of our application, we still need to understand how hardware features can cause memory bottlenecks. To do so, we use three architecture-dependent metrics. The first metric is arithmetic intensity, or AI, which is defined as the number of floating point or arithmetic operations per L1 cache line access. This metric is defined the compute intensity of our application. The second metric is the LS level cache misses per kilo instruction, or MPKI, defined as the LS level cache misses per 1,000 instruction. This metric shows the memory intensity of a particular application. Third, we define a new metric called last to first miss ratio or LFMR, which is defined by the last level cache misses per L1 cache misses in the application. This metric shows how much the application benefits from the L2 and L3 caches. The goal for scalability analysis is to identify the specific sources that list to date movement bottleneck in an application. To do so, we use our new DAMOVE SYN simulator, which integrates the Z Team CPU simulator with the Emulator Memory Simulator. With our simulator, we evaluate three different system configurations. The first system configuration is of a whole CPU system, which has a deep cache hierarchy, which is constituted by private L1 and L2 caches and shared L3 caches. The second configuration is of an NDP system with only private L1 cache. In our paper, we evaluate a third configuration, which builds on top of configuration one. This configuration adds prefetchers on top of configuration one. However, we omit some configuration in here in this talk. During our scalability analysis, we vary a number of cores, not three system configurations from one to 256. We use a 3D stack memory device as the main memory device in all three different system configurations. In such setup, the whole CPU system access memory through an off-chip link, while the NDP system, which sits in the logic layer of the 3D device, access memory through high-speed interconnections, which offers high memory bandwidth and lower access memory latency. Now, we apply step one of our methodology over a large set of applications. In this work, we analyze 145 applications from different domains, including graph processing, deep neural networks, physics, high-performance computing, genomics, and many more. From such applications, we select functions that takes at least 3% of the clock cycles of the total execution of the application and has a memory bound metric larger than 30%. We find 144 functions from a total of 77,000 functions and selected 44 functions to apply step two and step three of our methodology and 100 functions to validate our workload methodology. Next, we use the selected 44 functions for our locality-based clustering. In the locality-based cluster, we use the k-means algorithm to cluster application across both spatial and temporal locality, forming two main groups, applications with low locality in orange and applications with higher locality in blue. The closer the function is to the bottom left corner of the chart, or in other words, the lower the spatial and temporal locality, the less likely is going to take advantage of a deep cache hierarchy. Next, we apply step three of our memory bottleneck analysis. We use the key metrics collected in step three, which are LFMR, MPKI, and arithmetic intensity, and also the temporal locality metric collected in step two to classify the applications into six different classes of memory bottlenecks. Those classes of memory bottlenecks are DRAM bandwidth bound applications, DRAM latency bound applications, L1 and L2 cache capacity bottleneck applications, L3 cache contention bottleneck applications, L1 cache capacity bottleneck applications, and compute bound applications. Then we apply the scalability analysis over the six classes of data movement bottlenecks in order to identify 
the most suitable data movement mitigation technique for each class of data movement bottleneck. We highlight how we apply our scalability analysis for Duran bandwidth bound application. The Duran bandwidth bound applications have low temporal locality, high less process ratio, high MPKI, and lower automatic intensity. Since this application has high MPKI, they exert high memory pressure on the memory subsystems. From this high memory pressure, we expect that the applications are going to require a high memory bandwidth from the memory subsystem. We analyze how such high memory bandwidth usage impacts the performance. As we observe in the plot, the host performance scales well until the bandwidth saturates at 64 core count. On the other hand, the NDP system scales better without saturating alongside the attained bandwidth provided by the high memory bandwidth device. Then, we conclude that for Duran bandwidth bound applications, the NDP system performs better than the whole system because it can take advantage of the internal Duran bandwidth available inside the Duran device. Next, we also analyze the energy consumption of Duran bandwidth bound applications. Since Duran bandwidth bound applications have high less thrustness ratio, they do not make an effective use of the L2 and L3 caches. Now, we are going to understand how such inefficiency leads to energy consumption in the host and NDP systems. We observe that energy consumption in the host system is dominated by cache lookups and also of cheap data transfers. On the other hand, NTP provides large system energy reduction since it does not access L2 and L3 caches and also skip the off chip links. Then we conclude that the NTP system can reduce the energy consumption of Duran bandwidth bound applications because it can eliminate the off chip IO traffic and also the cache lookups. We invite you to check our paper for detailed analysis for each one of the six classes of data movement bottlenecks. Next, you want to calculate the accuracy of our workload characterization on a large set of functions. To do so, we perform a two-phase validation. In the first phase, we calculate the threshold values that define low-high boundaries for each one of the four key metrics used to cluster the initial 44 functions. Then, in phase two, we use the remaining 100 functions to classify the applications using our step two and step three of our methodology into one of the six classes of data movement bottlenecks. Then we say that a function has been correctly classified into one of the six classes of data movement bottlenecks if and only if it follows the threshold values and also follow the expected uh, performance and energy distribution of the assigned class in terms of NTP and host performance. Based on this, our methodology can accurately classify 97% of the functions into one of the six memory bottleneck classes. We invite you to check more analysis and discussion in our paper, including the effect of less level cache in our workload methodology classification, which we see that large L3 cache size can mitigate some cache contention issues. Also, the summary of our workload characterization, including work workload characterization using other cores for host and NTP systems, the limitation for methodology, and the benchmark diversity of our move benchmark suite. You can find all of that in the full draft of our paper. Finally, I'm going to briefly talk about our case studies. There are still many open research questions related to NDP system design, including how to design good interconnections for NDP systems, data mapping allocation, NDP core design, offloading granularity, programmability, coherence, system integration, and much more. Therefore, our goal here is to demonstrate how that move can be useful to study some of those system designs. We provide four case studies in your paper. In the first case study, we studied the load balance and interval communication of NDP cores. We observed that portion of the memory request NDP core issues go to remote faults, thus increasing the memory access latency for the NDP cores. We expect that the move can be used to study better interconnection networks for NDP architectures. In the second case study, we evaluate the performance benefits of executing some applications of our benchmark suite on an NDP accelerator compared to running on a compute-centric version of the same accelerator. We observe that the NDP accelerator is faster than the compute-centric accelerator for applications in class 1A and class 1B, and is lower for applications in class 2C. Then we conclude that the move can be useful to design NDP accelerators for varying applications. In the third case study, we perform an ISO area and power comparison of NDP architectures using in other and out of other cores. We see that in other cores limits the performance for some applications because the stack instruction schedule in presenting the in other cores cannot exploit memory pluralisms. We expect that the move can be used to design better dynamic instruction scheduling mechanisms that can exploit memory parallelisms for NTP architectures without incurring the large area overheads of out of order cores. In the last case study, we studied the benefits of offloading simple structures to NTP cores, which can reduce the complexity of the NTP core design. We observe that few basic blocks in many applications are responsible for most of the less level cache misses. 
By offload such basic blocks to the NDP cores, we can provide up to 25% performance improvement compared to the whole CPU system for such applications. We expect that the move can be used to identify those simple instructions that can be offloaded to NDP cores, thus simplifying the design of NDP architectures. For more details of each one of those case studies, we invite you to check our paper. The move is open source and publicly released in our GitHub repository, which contains the whole set of workloads that we use for our benchmark suite and also the DAMOVE SIM simulator. You can get the move in our GitHub repository. To conclude, data movement is a major source of bottlenecks in modern systems. However, it is still unclear how we can identify different sources that lead to data movement bottlenecks and the most suitable data movement mitigation technique for a given data movement bottleneck. Therefore, the goal of this work is twofold. First, we want to design a methodology that can identify sources of data movement bottleneck. And second, we want to compare computer memory sensitive data movement mitigation techniques. To do so, we perform a large scale application characterization to identify the key metrics that can review the sources of data movement bottleneck in large number of applications. Based on that, we draw four key contributions. The first key contribution is of experimental characterization of 77,000 functions across 245 applications. We develop and validate a methodology that can characterize applications based on the data movement bottlenecks and also to understand the relationship with different data movement bottlenecks with different data movement mitigation techniques, including the data process. Using our methodology, we developed DAMOV, a benchmark suite with 144 functions for data movement related studies. Fourth, we highlight the move applicability to open research problems with four case studies. The move is open source and public release in our GitHub repository. Thanks for listening.